Hello everybody, today I would like to introduce you to an amazing guy. He's a doctor, he's Dr. Schiff. We will talk about epigenetics. You will learn about that if you don't know. You will like it, it's amazing. So follow this interview. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I, I'm great, and you? Fine, fine. Uh, I'm very glad to, to do an interview with you because yeah. we will be able to understand more success principles or relationship principles and how you can explain us how it works. And what is, what is epigenetics? Epigenetics is what goes beyond the genes. We get our genes from our father and mother and they evolve in human evolution for millions of years. Very hard to change. And for a long time, genetic determinism thought that that's it. You get a smart gene, you'll become smart. You get a stupid <laughs> gene, you'll become stupid. Cancer gene, you'll get cancer. And there was a tremendous effort in the last decade to map the genes. So we will figure out you know, who is going to get cancer and who is not. And if you remember all the um, uh, ads in, in 10 years ago about the human genome, how, the map of life, and how they will be able to figure out everything. The biggest frustration actually came when they tried to understand human disease. And although we have a few diseases, which we call them Mendelianly inherited, that is, if you get two copies from your father and your mother of that defective gene, you'll get a disease. A good example could be familial Alzheimer's. There are certain cancers that do that. But they're very few. They represent a very, very small fraction of human disease. And when they try to understand you know, what causes schizophrenia, or what causes um, you know, mental, other mental disorders, what causes Alzheimer's, what causes diabetes, they couldn't find anything. About uh, the genes. The genes. And they kept looking. So when they couldn't find they say, OK, if we had 100,000 people, we'll find it. So they did 100,000, and they couldn't find very strong signals. So they say, let's take a million people, and we'll find it. And each time, they would get more money from the government to look for more mapping. Uh, but the truth is that although, of course, genes are the letters of the language, a language is not just composed of letters. It is composed of sentences. So the sentences have to be punctuated. And the punctuation marks are the epigenetics. They make sense out of the genetic language. And what's interesting about epigenetics, it really has two components. One component is deciding whether your DNA will become a liver or a heart or an eye or a leg. And that process, which is fascinating by itself, that the same DNA could give you so many different things, right? An eye and a heart are so different, but they still have exactly the same DNA. So somehow DNA manages to program itself to, to get those letters, uh, those um, punctuations that will tell us, now you do this, and here you do that, and when you hit this, you do that. And that develops during gestation. When the embryo is in the womb of his mother or her mother, they develop slowly what we call a pattern of epigenetics. So each DNA in each cell has a completely different identity. So now if you take a DNA from a mummy that died 5,000 years ago, you can map the DNA so you'll get the sequence, so you know who the father and mother were, what ethnic background they came from. But you can also map those marks at very high accuracy and know what tissue they came from. So I can look at the DNA and say, oh, this comes from an eye. This comes from a, uh, from a, uh, from a gastrointestinal tract. This comes from a liver. And so our DNA has two identities. Okay, they know uh, the parent, where they, they come from. So if you, if you can look at the sequence, you'll know which parents they had, right? Because you'll know if they are Caucasians or, uh, or Africans or you know, within Africa. What yeah, when I, when I say pa parent, it's... Uh, I, I, you I, mean if, if the DNA came from the father or the mother? Uh, no, I mean like you, when you have a kind of, of tree, um, yeah. you know the... Genetic, the genetic tree. The, the, yes. Yes, of course. If you do good genetics, you'll be able to figure out who came from where, right? Yeah. That's for sure. But you will not know whether that DNA comes from a liver or a kidney. Yeah. With that, you need to do epigenetics. So for a long time, we understood epigenetics. I have been working on it for 40 years. But the big question was, is it deterministic too? Is it already determined, you know, that after a while you'll become an egg or an eye or a, or a leg, and you can't do anything about it? So when I was a student, the idea was that epigenetics is like genetics. It's predetermined. That means... So you can't change anything. You can't change anything. 
you were born with and, and that's it and it you know and the monkey and the humans all have the same epigenetics and this is it this is the, defined by evolution so to a large extent this kind of thinking is good right because you don't have to bother right if you were born to a rich family you'll be rich if you're born to a poor family you'll be poor if you're stupid you'll be stupid you can't change smart. anything you can't change anything life is good and free and i think darwin's theory gave a lot of freedom to people freedom from religion freedom from history freedom from everything because it's all in the genes and you can blame them for everything yeah oh shit uh, i don't have the the right genes to be happy for exactly you. exactly and people do it all the time or you know in the worst case you can develop racism right because races that have good genes should stay and the others should go and for example nazi ideology used a lot of this darwinist thinking in, in you know trying to create a super race and to clean the race from other races and things like that. so we can see uh, how a darwinist theory determinist genetics even though darwin himself recognized the genes are not everything he didn't know what genes were but he recognized that there must be some role for environment. He just didn't understand the role. But uh, generally, determinism had a huge impact on the 20th century thinking. And it's still very dominant in the way. And how old were you when you started to wonder about that? So I started my, th my PhD. I was studying dentistry. And I needed to get a doctorate in dentistry, so I had to do some research. So I met this guy who came from Caltech called Grazin. And he found the first DNA methylation group, which is the basic epigenetic mark on a virus that infects E. coli. Sounds like totally boring and irrelevant. But from this, the whole thing started. And he asked me to find out, to, to find out uh, how this works. And I asked him, why should I find out how this works? It doesn't sound to me very interesting. Why do I care about a virus that infects E. coli and does nothing in the end? And he says, just because I'm curious. And I asked him, is it important for cancer or you know, for something important? And he says, I don't know and I don't care. But these are the basic drives of science. You know, scientists don't do things because they want to cure cancer. They do things because they're curious. Eventually, that leads to a cure for cancer. So that's how we started. And then we were very deterministic in the beginning. But I was bothered by this because most biochemical reactions can go both ways and if methylation can go both ways the epigenetic marks are biochemical reactions then there should be a way to change it and then they should be affected by other things so um, the first suggestion i had uh, when i came to mcgill was that that's important in cancer that if indeed those letter uh, those punctuation marks define how dna works perhaps this is how cancer is driven they change the code and when you change the code, that computer will do other things. So you, you, you started with a uh, kind of questions. You were wondering a lot of questions. Yes, especially about cancer. Because the dominant philosophy in cancer at the time was that it's all genetic. And they love the question, what if, what if something different, right? Yeah. Okay. And I'm also a, an anarchist, so I don't like dogmas. And, um, and what I hated about science is that everything was dogmatic. And in spite of the fact that people think about scientists as you know, free-thinking people and, and they're curious, most of science is highly dogmatic. So if somebody decided that epigenetic marks don't change, and we'll talk specifically about a chemical coating of DNA, which we call methylation. It's a methyl group, it's a very small chemical that is added to DNA by enzymes. It's a biochemical reaction during development. And their idea was that it's added and it stays, and it never goes away. And I asked why, why, mm. and they, they said, because it's so. And so if you try to publish a paper that questions that, they will kill your paper or kill your grant or not give you a job, right. So science has very interesting ways um, to create dogma that everybody follows. And what's dangerous about dogma, it misleads you to think that actually you're proving the dogma, right? Yeah, you, because you, any evidence against you will ignore. You find, you research something to prove that you are true. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and what is interesting also, if you send a paper to publish that fits the dogma, it's very easy to get it published. But if you send a paper that is against the dogma, nobody will publish it. So essentially, the dogma perpetuates itself. And you can build a whole building of cards because, because of the way scientific structures work. 
And so really, it, it is training people to to find things we found before. Yes, <laughs> yes. using better technology. Technology yeah. scientists love, uh, but they don't love ideas. They, they, they like to stick to the same ideas. At some point, ideas take over, like Darwinist theory, and, and that's it. Nobody will question it. And anybody who questions it becomes an anti-science. It's very interesting because you started to have your, you, you, to question, to have questions, and a lot of people stop to do that because they want to be loved by yeah. others. How did you um, overcome the criti criticism of people? Oh, there was a lot of trouble. It wasn't easy, and it's still not easy. Uh, scientists are as like a social group that, that loves to love each other who fits with, with the ideas that they have. It's exactly like any herd that, yeah. you know, but has... Why, why did you have the, the power, the strength... To ask questions. To continue. Because you can start to ask questions and, okay, okay, I stop. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what most people do. That's yeah. how we kill our students, right? Most students come and ask questions. Yeah, and, and children ask questions. Yeah, and then we gradually train them not to ask questions. Oh, ask questions that are legitimate questions. Yeah, everybody asks questions in science, but they have to be legitimate within the boundaries of what's defined as legitimate. But a lot of it also has to do with the structure of universities that essentially replace the church. And the basic ideas in the basic religions was that there is a truth, right? There is an ultimate truth. And the role of the priest or the minister is to make sure that that truth is transmitted, per per perpetuated, perpetuated, right? And they built inquisitions, right? What is an inquisition? Essentially, inquisition was built to make sure that priests don't deviate from the dogma, right? They don't teach things that are against what they conceive was biblical thinking. And so they have institutions that, that do that and make sure that the dogma is perpetuated. And essentially, science replaced, you know, uh, the church and Darwinism to a large extent replaced the Bible by giving a, a theory of, of life that, that was alternative to it to the biblical theory. And then again, uh, the same institutions are now keeping that uh, you know, in order. So it was very tough to suggest that it's possible that genes are not everything, and they can change in a non-deterministic way. That means in response to the environment. And actually, the first person who suggested that was Lamarck, who actually suggested the theory of evolution before Darwin. Uh, but he wrote in French, and uh, Darwin wrote in English, which was a big difference, and, <laughs> and the Darwinist theory took over. And Lamarckian became almost so a yeah, if I, have an, if I have an idea, I have to learn to, to write it in English. There's no question that if you <laughs> write it in English, you will get bigger audiences. Right? Yeah. And, um, and probably it wasn't obvious when Lamarck wrote, but eventually English became the dominant language of the world. And therefore, and a lot of Lamarckian books are not even translated in English. So they were not accessible to the general public. And most of Lamarckian theory was written by people who speak French. And it's amazing. So yeah, and, and so neither Lamarck or Darwin understood what they're saying, right? Because they didn't know the genes exist. They didn't understand how it hurt. It was, again, uh, intu it was intuition, right? They both had good intuitions. And, and, and they both were right to a certain extent. It's when they became dogma that that just was just one question because it's an, it's a, interesting because when you when you talk about intuition to a lot of people they say oh it's not it's uh, it's weird I I don't believe that and it's amazing because in science yeah. uh, a lot of people use intuition to to find things it's all about intuition what is intuition for you intuition is something we can't define it's because there are infinite possibilities to explain anything you know. Even when I make a protein, and I wanted to get it to work, right? So how much salt do I use? How much magnesium do I use? How much buffer do I use? It's impossible. If I build a matrix, it will be infinite. I'll spend you know, a million years to figure out how the proteins work. But somebody just looks at the protein and gets it to work. And another guy will spend days and days, and nothing will happen. And he can't explain why. He just figures out, you know, we need this magnesium, we need potassium, we need that, and it works. And uh, the same with ideas. Any idea you know, has millions of possibilities. If you just sit down like an economist and build a matrix and try to figure out the model, it will not work. You, know, you have to guess what it works. So what, we don't understand how intuition works. It's amazing. It has to do with the way the human brain is wired. And, 
any. It probably we, we exceeds do, we, our capacity to understand. We don't know where it, com it comes from. No, we don't. And we don't know which neuronal connections create that capacity. Uh, but um, definitely intuition is the major driving force in science. Intuition and anarchy rather than order. What, what did you say? Anarchy, chaos, and disorder. Okay. Yeah. And you know what, what's interesting is that and just, just one thing, what, what is the difference for you between imagination and intuition? I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. But I think intuition is, is a more practical form of imagination that okay. leads to practical results, you know? Some people have intuition what, what business will work, and some in people have intuition what scientific idea is going to be true. Um, and I think um, they don't need all the data to, to get it. Then people spend years and years to build the data. But why did they think that? It's very, very hard. So it's not, imagination could be about a lot of other things, not necessarily practical. Things. Okay, and as a scientist, uh, do you have to learn to maybe follow your intuition? Because sometimes you have the intuition and the dogma say the opposite, for example. Yes. Do you have to learn to believe in your intuition? That's where environment comes. You have to be nurtured in such an environment. We can nurture our children and our students to, to develop intuitive skills or nurture them to, um, to suppress those intuitive skills. And how do, you, how do you do that? How do we can do that? I think it has to do with the people you, you, you lived with, both as parents and as teachers. And that's why you can see you know, lineages of Nobel Prize winners. You know? Nobel Prize winners usually train people who get Nobel Prizes. And I think that has to do with, with you know, building a free um, environment where people are free to roam. And the problem is that we do exactly the opposite uh, because we try to structure everything. And so we have three years to get a bachelor's degree and two years to get a master's. And you have to start do certain courses to get that. And that completely suppresses uh, human intuition. It's probably good for doing uh, mundane things. Because I think after intuition, you need the people who actually work out the details. And, and this is a different kind of type of people. But to create the inventors, the creators, it's a completely different way. And I think it has to do with environment. Absolutely environment. The so do you think, do you think studies the skills intuition? Yes. Many times I tell my students not to read. Because if they read, they'll come up with ideas that can bias them. So what I do when, before I decide to do something, I decide to do it. Then I go and read. Because I don't want the ideas to buy, I don't want me to be biased by other things. And many times, you know, people say, oh, it can't work. And they have papers that say it can't work, right? So if you see those papers first, you will never think about it. Mm. It's, a, it's a sentence. They, they did it because they didn't know yeah. that it was impossible. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so you need to maintain a balance of ignorance and knowledge. There is a balance. And nice. that balance is also intuitive, right? How much knowledge is good and how much knowledge is starting to inhibit you. So some knowledge inspires you if it's chaotic. Uh, but if it's very organized, it can, it can uh, limit you. I would love to know, because I, le I understand the principle of epigenetics, but uh, I would love to know how, how it works for you. You, can, you find uh, a cell, yeah. and how do you, uh, how do you know that, uh, how do you see that the environment have an impact, has an impact on the cell? Right, so let's go, so we stopped here in determinism. Yeah. So the next stage was, so when we saw that, method, that it changes in cancer, you can, um, you can ask question, why does it change in cancer, right? Why is it indeterministic? Why, some reason, my cancer cell decided to have a different epigenetic pattern? So we spent a lot of time to learn how to map it. So we can you know, take the DNA and map the epigenetic marks. We also can start testing different environments, you know, even in a tissue dish, culture dish, add things and remove things and see if they can change it. And um, so you can add and, and you, know, you can map before and after and see that you added you know, oxygen, for example, or you can add, uh, you know, change the acidic content, change the kind of food the cells are getting. So you can do a lot of things to do, do that. Okay, you, so you, you do a lot of experience yes. in changing one thing and see uh, the change inside the cell. Yes, inside the DNA, right? But the big question was, the big question was, Okay, cancer people understand how it can change. You know, it's very dramatic. So maybe in you know radiation and uh, you know 
big signals can deliver. But does it happen as a normal process that uh, we are changing because the environment is changing, so we are adapting our genome to the environment? And to this, idea came to me by a meeting that I had in a bar in Madrid, right? So all ideas come after alcohol. If you don't drink alcohol, it's very good chance you'll never come up with good ideas. So, this is an uh, advice. Yeah. <laughs> so we were, uh, so I was in a meeting in Spain, a meeting on the brain, and uh, I wasn't working on the brain. I was working on cancer. But the chairman of my department uh, tried to convince me to, to work on the brain. Uh, so there was another guy in Montreal, Michael Mini. And uh, I never met him here, but I met him in Madrid. <laughs> and we go to the bar and uh, we start drinking beer. And uh, after many beers, he uh, tells me about what he's doing. And he was working on maternal care in rats. So, you know, when little rats, a pup, which we call pups, are born, the mother rat is, is taking care of them, like mother human. She licks and grooms them and she feeds them. And you can actually see that some rats do more of this than others. So he noticed that there is a big Gaussian distribution, distribution of how much maternal care the animals do. And then he asked the question, what happened to these animals who got a lot of maternal care and very little maternal care? And uh, he found that animals that got a lot of maternal care do much better in certain things than animals that and got very the, little. The male has, has, has a less impact. Oh, there's no male there. It's only female. Right? <laughs> okay. Male just give the sperm. And um, because, you know, in mammals like ourselves, most of our attachment is to the mother, right? To the, to the breastfeeding. That's why we're called mammals. Yeah. Mammary gland, right? So he found that they have really physical differences, not just you know, behavioral differences. Okay. For example, these animals get... In the stressed. DNA? Oh, that was the <laughs> question, right? So the first question was, is it genetic, right? Is the mother, are the mothers that lick more have a different gene, right, than the mothers that lick less, right? And so in the beginning, you thought it's genetic, like everybody else, right? Yeah. So how do you test that? In animals, it's very easy. What you do is what we call cross-fostering. So you take an animal that was born to a mother that is a yeah, high and, and, and give it to the low and versus. That's amazing. Right? And then he found that uh, it is actually not the biological mother, but the mother that takes care of you that makes the difference, right? So it can't be different. You have to be patient when, when you are a scientist. Oh, of course. It takes many, many years. <laughs> so then uh, after he told me this, uh, you know, in the beginning, I didn't really care because I was a hard scientist. No, not, Maternal love is not something we cared about. But then we started thinking about it. I said, oh, maybe it's the DNA methylation. Maybe this epigenetic changes. So maybe what happens when the mother takes care of the pup, it changes the way genes are programmed. It's very interesting for me because I see how many questions you have to ask to find new things. Of course. And it's the same for people in their lives. If you don't ask questions, Absolutely. you can find solutions. And, and stepwise and have a lot of patience. <laughs> Our meeting in Madrid was 20-something years ago, wow. 23 years ago, okay? And I think it took 10 years that we didn't do anything. And then at some point, uh, there was a student coming from England, and uh, we decided that he will work on it between the two of us. And we started to ask whether the mother's love is changing the way DNA is chemically marked in the brain. And we found that it does. And we also found wow, it's, a, if I love that. a chemical pathway that does that, right? So now it's not voodoo anymore. There's <laughs> actually a chemical link that can link the mother's behavior and the way your DNA is marked in the brain. So we can say then that love changed behavior, that love changed DNA. Of course. Well, at least in those rats. So now the question <laughs> asks, how do you prove it in humans, right? Yeah, because we are interested in, in not making love in rats, but in humans. But easy to find a, to find a baby and uh... <laughs> give it to a rat to take <laughs> care of it. So uh, we, um, yeah, and in humans, the, the problem with humans is you cannot prove anything, right? Because, because we, we, can't, can't, we can't, we can do experiments. We can't do the same experiments, right? We can't cross foster humans. It's done, you know, they're orphans that are taken care of by other mothers. It happens, but it's never a controlled experiment, right? The control experiments take the same mother, split her kids to two, some live with her, and some give to another mother. But of course, we can't do that. But what we can. So is it just, it's, are you okay when I stop you? Sure. Okay. 
because I have a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, so the best for the evolution of science w w would be to, to, to test the DNA with a, with a mother and an orphan, right? And you, you can't do that. It's not, you don't have the right to do exactly. that. Exactly, it's not ethical, right? And so uh, the ethical uh, limits the grow of uh, science? Of course. Okay. But, but it's good. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> how, how do you know what is ethical? Uh, that's a different question. Yeah. Ethics is a very hard thing to define, right? And, um, you know, if you have a religion, then it's defined by the religion. <laughs> if, it's, if you don't have a religion, it's very hard to agree on ethics. Because something can, can be okay for you, yeah. because you see the outcome. Yes. You can say, oh, it's very important. And maybe it will damage these children, but the world will benefit from it. Right? Yeah, and that's easy. Yeah. But we don't do that. I think all humans, except the Nazis and maybe the Japanese in World War II, agree that we don't do experiments on humans, unless it's good for them. So you think, you think it's a good thing? Yes. Okay. But what we could do with humans is is do what we call associations, you know, connect things. So uh, there's another psychiatrist here at McGill called Gustavo Turecki, and he was collecting brains from people who committed suicide. And uh, also he was um, doing a very good documentation of their behavior and psychological situation throughout their life. And so we had access now to brains of people who died, uh, but some were abused as children, and some had a very good life as children. Okay, so you, we can do tests when people die? Yes, so we can compare their brains and see if we see the same differences that we saw in the rats, where we could do an experiment, right? And we exactly found the same genes that were changed in the rats that didn't get a lot of care from the mother. The same genes were different in humans who were abused as children. So this started giving us the idea that the environment uh, can really change the way DNA is marked. And not only the environment, you know, not just chemicals, but the social environment. Yes, yeah, not only your world. inside environment, right. but also the your... external environment and the social environment. And that has led us to a... What, 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 made, what difference do you do in between uh, social difference and external difference? No, social difference, you see, there's chemicals. Right? Radiation, sun, these are physical things. Okay. They can change your DNA. Okay. But the most amazing thing is that we talking to each other can change our DNA. And, th and that's completely harder to understand. That was a revolution, yeah. right? So For understand example, that these we can things say that our conversation changed together. Yes. Yes. It will change us in different ways. Okay. But it will have an impact. It will change the chemistry of DNA that will be memorized in the DNA, and that can have many effects. But it can be f uh, fearful for people. Yes. You can say, oh, if I, if I talk to him, I would be... It's true. And what that's is the, the, the limit? Right, but I think, I think the fact that it changes the DNA is good, right? Because, you know, our DNA evolved in evolution in millions of years. It's, it's not good enough to deal with changing environments. So what the DNA evolved also is a mechanism that can adjust itself to the environment, right? So your DNA doesn't know if you'll be born in Stockholm or be born in Ecuador. And life is totally different in Stockholm and Ecuador. But as you were born, you see the environment, and somehow you, the DNA is now marked to prepare you to Stockholm or Ecuador. And uh, the same happens with social environments, right? You know, if you're born to a, in, a, in, a, in a slums, you know, where people shoot each other for drugs and there's a very aggressive place. You need a complete different personality than yeah. if you're born in a, in a grand salon in Paris, right? And, and you're only going to be rich and delicate and, and uh, kind people. And so, you know, whatever is useful in the slums becomes totally misfit in the upper class and vice versa. You know, take an upper class kid, put him in a ghetto, he'll be shot in a day. Right? because he has no idea how to deal with this. So when the child is born, the child is sensing the environment and building his genome to fit with the environment. Um, the same has to do with food. You know, if, you're built, if you're born in a concentration camp, uh, 
you want every piece of food to turn into fat, so you keep it for the next meal. You don't know where your next meal is coming. So a baby will survive easily than an adult in the case. Right. So our system are much more plastic when we are children than later in life. We call them critical periods. These are periods where we learn and adjust our body, our, our DNA, to the world. And later on, we can still change the DNA, but it's more complicated because we already have built the program. So if we, can, if we, if we have a baby abused yeah. uh, for 10 years, for example, Oh, it will be very hard to change it. But there if are... He, if he has loved love after with his next family? It doesn't necessarily change it. We need to figure out ways to do that. Right? Because he is programmed to sense the world as a really bad place. Right? So everything in his behavior is built to deal with a bad place. Which is good. That's adaptation, right? Because we find ourselves in many different environments. So our DNA is ready to deal with each kind of environment. But in, in childhood, that child learned the world is really a bad place. And everybody you see might abuse you. So you better be very aggressive, very, uh, you know. Uh, and it works in the other, the other way. A children loved for 10, 10 years. Of course, they think the world is a good place, right? If he comes in a bad place. Oh, he will die. He will die in no time. Mm. And so, so I think... What happened, why is there a problem? Because evolution was prepared in a way that whatever you see in a childhood will usually stay. But now, in a modern world, environment changes so fast. So the fact that you were born to an abuse family doesn't mean you're always going to be living in that environment. Because you might go to a school, and the school kind of equalizes everybody. And most of the kids were not abused. So now an abused child is with a non-abused child. So his behavior trait is totally useless now. So because human mind has created environments even faster than epigenetics can fit with, uh, what happens is we get a misfit. I'll give you an example. When you're born to a very poor family, the brain is sensing poverty, and the brain will prepare everything in your body. The DNA will be programmed so that you, whenever you see food, you eat everything, right? Because you know that you might get food once every month. So better eat everything and turn it into fat, right? So that's how your whole system is prepared. The, the brain, the body is prepared to store every piece of food to make it into fat and to eat a lot. We call it binging, right? But then you live in the United States. Being poor doesn't mean you don't have access to food. Yeah, and you, and that food is cheap, and you can buy a McDonald's. Bad food is cheap. Yeah, or very rich food, you know, high calorie food. Yeah, and you can buy a one ninety nine. You know, McDonald's that has a lot of calories, and you can buy them every day. So now you have this phenotype of binging, which would have saved your life in a jungle in Africa or, you know, in a desert in Sahara, and in, in a city in the United States where you have constant access to food, and you binge, and you become obese. When you become obese, you develop diabetes and other things. So it's not bad what you have. It's just in the wrong context. So the big challenge of epigenetics is to outdo evolution, right? Because now, what happens, the evolution of the human mind is much faster than the evolution of our genome. And therefore, you know, we have created environments that change much faster than our genomes anticipate. So now the challenge is, can we now change it back? Well, it's not easy. Just by putting him in a good family, we're not changing back. It might create the situation even worse, right? Because he doesn't know how to deal with a good family. He thinks everybody's an enemy. He's going to be aggressive. He's going to be angry. So that might not be the way to go. We have to now think about how to reverse those epigenetic programs and fit them into the new world. So I had to take a person who was uh, prepared to, to binge because he anticipated you know, famine to live in a world where there's a lot of food. It might not be simple. But the optimistic message is that it should be doable because the whole system is reversible, right? So if the system is reversible, if we know how to reverse it, we should be able to do it. And that, I think, where a lot of experimentation will go. You know, what kind of interventions uh, will actually erase this and prepare a person to the new environment, the real environment, right? It's a kind of reset your... your reset your epigenome, right. So in certain cases, we will need to do that. 
In other cases, we'll need to build an environment that fits with this kind of schema type. For example, perhaps a kid who was abused needs a different kind of school than a kid who wasn't, right? Or it needs a different kind of teaching. Perhaps the one for all kind of education system that we have that is excellent for the upper middle class doesn't fit everybody. Mm. And we have to think about ways. So there are two ways to fix things. One is to change the environment to fit your genome or to change your genome to fit the new environment. And I think both are possible. So we, you, you, your research today has for purpose to find a way to change the genome. Yes, so we are looking at, at that. Right, I'm not a social scientist, so I don't change environments. But I think our research also can guide that. For example, I think hopefully one day education people will start thinking about what we're saying and say, okay, we need to change the way we build our classes to cater them more to the different backgrounds that people come into the class. Do you think the future will, f will see the DNA and create different group of teaching in... I, I hope we don't need to you know, examine each person's DNA, but we will examine each person's behavior and try to you know, readjust the system. Not only one way to explain, but maybe 10. Yes. And I think the other important implication is that early life is really important, that we need to invest in early life, because that's where we can make the biggest change, right? So, so if what, we what is the, the range? Uh, we don't know. It's probably two and a half, three years are very critical uh, for a lot of things, the way the brain develops, the way... Uh, you know, and love is the, is, the best, is, a, is the main uh, factor. I think love will prepare people to a good life. But if life is going to be bad, probably these people might not be in a good situation. Right? So I think uh, what's important is to prepare the people to the world that they're going to live in. Right? And so if you have a lot of love and you find yourself in a place where everybody shoots each other, it probably won't be useful. You, you probably be the okay. first victim. You know? So uh, it's, it's, it's amazing because we have to help people to, to fit exactly right. Maybe the, just as the next step, but not 10 steps after. Yeah, I mean, there, there are two ways to go. First, we, if we as a society already know that you know, countries like France and the United States and, and the United Kingdom and, and the rich Western countries, we know what kind of environment a person has to fit, right? We know that having a phenotype of being abused is not going to be useful in that world. So we as a society need to eliminate that as much as possible, to intervene as early as possible, that these children are built, prepared in an environment that will make them fit for the Western environment. And that probably might not be true for other places in the world. And just one, one question. For example, we, do, you, do you think uh, about the epigenetics? People see the, differ of the video. Do you think it will be a difference uh, between me, for example, I, I am listening to you, and people, the fact that I uh, I'm, I'm next to you, the epigenetics works. So do you think the, the learning will be different, the fact I'm, I'm with you, be rather than watching a video? Yes. And that's very interesting, right? Because in spite of technology, we still have to travel, right? And my wife keeps asking me, why, why do you travel so much? And I say, I need to meet people. And so I if I do the same interview by Skype? It will be different. I will be different, and you will be different. And I don't understand why. But there's something about human interactions, the way we evolve, that requires a physical presence. And only the physical presence creates that intense social interaction. Just one other example. If I say, um, if I say I love you, yeah. My girlfriend, right, on we Skype, on Skype, it's and I love same. you, and uh, the it's same, the I same. love you in, in, in physical way. It's not the same. Most humans will tell you it's not the same, <laughs> right? Because we cannot, we can mimic some things, but we cannot mimic everything. Uh, it might have to do with hormones that you know that we need to smell, um, and the physical presence that is is not exactly the same presence that we get on the screen. Uh, definitely a video meeting is better than just a sound meeting, right? 
and better than just a written meeting. The worst is emails, right? That's the worst way of communication. I'm totally useless with emails. Me too. Uh, I, I answer maybe 0.1% of them. And even when I answer, it's, it's useless. I can't think. Um, you know, I don't like the phone. I like to meet people in person. Me too. Drink with them. And then you come up with ideas. And this is something we under it's appreciate. A, it's a kind of limit of the social network. Yeah. You can have a, a lot of friends, but it's virtual it's, friends. It's very different. And I can assess, you know, at what point did I develop ideas? Because just, I just one question. Because I love this this um, theory. So I have my, my my own company, and we work a lot in. Uh, I don't know how to say that in English. In uh, home office. Yes. So you can have a lot of difference, a lot, a big difference between work together in the same place than work in home Absolutely. office. Absolutely. I think there are certain things you can do in a home office if there are simple technical issues that have very limited number of variables, right? And you, know, you, can, you can ask simple questions. But if you really need to be creative and think about new things, it's not working. Do you know the principle of mastermind? The fact that uh, you know the book and Think and Grow Rich of Napoleon Hill? No. He, 50 years ago, he did a lot of interviews of the biggest entrepreneurs, and he said that all the biggest entrepreneurs have kind of a peer, peer groups, and they meet together every month to, to, to talk to, to together. So do you think the, the epigenetics has a huge impact in this kind of group because, because they, they meet every, every month, for example? Uh, yes, absolutely. That's the best environment, right? That's the social environment. So it's need. not maybe what they share. No, it's just, it's just meeting. Yeah. You know, sometimes I would sit in a lecture and come up with great ideas that have nothing to do with what's spoken in the le le lecture. And so, you know, there are indirect links that are very hard to sometimes understand. And uh, if you want to become b brilliant, you have to meet <laughs> a lot of time brilliant person. Not necessarily, right? It, not necessarily. Sometimes you get the ideas from meeting not brilliant people, right? It's not easy. I don't think there's a formula for this mm. because it's probably so complicated that we can't reduce it to simple concepts, okay. but I think we understand that the way the brain is, is working is highly influenced by others. And, uh, but what kind of influence? And that's people with intuition, I think, figure out who they need to talk to to get ideas. And that guy might not give him ideas, you know? You know, for example, surfing the web is, is another place where, you know, you go nowhere and you get this idea. So I think this is um, another... The nice thing about the web, it increases randomness, right? Because when you surf, you might not go to the exact places you wanted to go. And yeah, that's and where you get the great ideas, right? So my challenge in life is to increase randomness. So I want to have random encounters. In your and life? I, uh, yeah. And the more random encounters I have, the bigger chance I have to develop new ideas. And, you know, my ideas come from very different places. You know, so if uh, you do every day the same thing and meet the same people... Oh, it's not going to be good. No. And, uh, but you need to have an inquisitive mind, right? So you need to meet people and ask questions and, and start talking to them. And I found, especially travel is important because people who travel are not usual people. You know, there is a select group of people who are inquisitive, otherwise they wouldn't travel. And Usually they're also successful people, so you know they are people who did things, and that's why they can afford traveling. And and, and so that's uh, you know I can sit on a plane and talk to somebody who makes yachts, and you know, and that will get an idea, or somebody who's a chef, or you know somebody who um, who is a housewife. But you know you ne you never know where your ideas will come from. So the and more you you create and provoke. Um, new new things uh, the, the greater your chance yeah i think it's a question of statistics right and you increase your probability by by just having more encounters 
And of course, you need to have the brain that can has this talent to, to see something important when it sees it. But the more encounters you have, the more important things will come. And if you meet some, somebody with a bad, mo uh, bad feeling, who is not a pessimistic, pessimistic uh, guy, for example, can you be afraid to, with epigenetics to... Yeah, that, has a, that definitely has, a, has an impact, yeah. And, um, you know, it might be useful sometimes. We also d need to be pessimistic sometimes because life is not always good, right? And so you need a combination of, of the, the two. Let, let's consider, how do you psychotherapist, my dear? Psychotherapy? Yeah. Yes. Um, you can have a lot of people with a bad, um, with a huge problem. Yes. And every day yeah. people come with these feelings. Do you think he will change his own DNA? His psychotherapy, yeah. You know, it's very interesting that psychotherapists also sometimes fall into serious mental problems. Some have mental problems before they come, <laughs> but a lot develop mental, serious mental problems. So there's no question it's a very harsh, you know, job. There's no question it, it has an impact on you. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> And what is uh, the, the next step for you uh, today? So... You know, I'm a biochemist. I want to understand what are the enzymes that put on and remove methyl groups because this will allow us to be able to manipulate them. Uh, so at the level of the chemistry, I still want to understand the chemistry very well. Uh, at the bigger level, I want to understand how to intervene in a useful way. So cancer is a very good place to start because so the effects are big there. We uh, developing drugs. But the more interesting thing for me is to understand how cancer is created to start with. And is, do the epigenetic processes give us a hint that we might have been wrong in thinking how cancer starts? And for example, one of the most interesting questions in cancer is how the social environment is involved in, in cancer. And, and this is something that people dismissed They thought, oh, cancer is just a mutation in a cell, and that cell is selected by the immune process, and you get cancer, which might be true in some cases. But I think cancer is a disease of people, of the whole person, not just of the tumor, and of the person in a context, right? Not on his own. We're not, none of us is on his own. We all are interacting. And, uh, and I think that we need to provide... A mechanism that explains that, and probably the immune system is one of the most interesting things where these things happen. Because the immune system kind of integrates environmental information. It talks to the brain, but also controls all these things like cancer and other things. And so I think that that's the most interesting thing, is to understand how the immune system talks to the environment and how the immune system controls human health and disease, whether it's cancer, whether it's schizophrenia, whether it's Alzheimer's. I think it's all through these conduits. So we need to understand more, more of that. And we need to see if we can um, you know, start looking at cancer as a systemic disease rather than as a you know, disease of the tumor. But if you say systemic, it will, it will become, become more complex to... It is complex, right? But I think there are certain things we can do that can have a huge impact. So, for example, What is the role of the psychosocial environment in getting cancer and in treating cancer, right? That's and do you think it can explain why miracle comes, for example, some, some yes. someone no. with a cancer starts to laugh yeah, often? So. No, I think so. I think these anecdotal you know, examples uh, teach us about a more fundamental thing that modern medicine totally miss is that a human is not a broken leg and a human is not just the human it's the entire interactome you know who that human interacts with that is important and humans interact with animals they interact with humans they interact with the physical environment all of this is important and we miss it repeatedly even today my medical students don't get it 
they will develop to be, you know, a breast oncologist or a chemotherapist or, and they, you know, as much as they say they're going to talk to each other, they're not. And because there is no fundamental understanding how these things interact. But once we have, you know, mechanisms, we will be able Okay, so approach. you are saying that people focus, for example, here and here right. and here, but let people start to find a global way to how they each thing right. is direct. For example, I, I will give you an example, my own example. My son had an injury in his, his knees in his fourth grade, multiligament injury. So it's a very complicated surgery. So we went to the best surgeon, and he did a beautiful job of fixing it. But after you do that, the kid cannot walk for a long time because it fixes his leg. What is the implication of not being able to walk? You can't go to a bathroom. You can't climb the stairs. You can't go to your bedroom. You can't go to work. You, you destroy your social network. But there are a few tricks you can learn how to walk under these conditions. But they invested zero effort in that. And so for the surgeon, you know, if he cut it well and it, boom, it worked, he is happy. But the patient is not the ligament. The patient is the entire patient and his interactions. And I believe they so have you, a huge impact fix, on the healing. You fix that? But you don't fix it really, because to fix this, the immune system has to work well. You know, the inflammatory system has to work well. And that talks to the brain. And the brain talks to all the other things. So if you're stressed because you can't go to the bathroom or because you can't do the things you normally do, and you don't know how to deal with, with this situation, right? your healing will not work. And that's why the doctors are frustrated why sometimes they do everything perfect and it doesn't work. And so a surgeon has to be a psychologist. It can be the same with concept when the people uh, have no, no hairs and they are not prepared to interact with that. Right. And oh, anything. It could be anything, right? And, and that integrative approach to humans as you know, an integrator in the world do you I see think we'll the, change medicine. Do you see the movie Dr. Patch? No. Uh, you, you, could, you, can, you can watch this movie. Amazing movie about, uh, about a doctor and he changed totally the approach. It is a true story. Yeah. I will uh, write you the good, movie good, chapter. Good. So, so we have to... What could be your suggestion? We have to prepare people to um, a global way yeah. to see their disease? Yes. When a doctor who leads the treatment of such a disease has to look at all the aspects and try to think about how we integrate them so that we improve our chances of, of cure. But they are not trained to... No. No. They're very good at what they're doing. One doctor knows it how to... It's a kind of... A, in someone who is specialized, uh, specialized on car, yeah. they know mechanics, but uh, they don't know how emo emotion works. and. You're right. So do you think you, we have to train doctor, or do you think the best is to have two, two people? No, we need to train doctors differently, and we need to have two people, right? So nobody could be an expert, but we have to train people to be able to talk. And if that doctor will gather experts, but that's not enough. He might be doing it, but it's not enough, because it's not real, because he doesn't know how to talk to them. And so, you know, every, every uh, medical procedure has to be done by team of people. But the team has really to be to know each other's language. So if the psychologist doesn't understand the surgery and the surgeon doesn't understand the psychology, it's not going to work. Even if they work together, it's not going to work. So you need to train different kinds of people. You don't need to know everything, but you need to be sensitive. You have an, inter an interface. Yes, and the interface is social. The interface is creating people who know how to talk and, and know how to listen. I saw on YouTube and Wiki Wikipedia uh, the definition about uh, what is a, your definition of the ep epigenome? I think it's the way uh, the way genes tick, the way genes work. Okay, I, I saw something about it is an interface. Yeah, be between the environment and the genome. Yes, we use that, but yeah, it, it's an interface with a lot of things. Okay, but it makes the genome work. It makes the genome relevant. The genome would have been totally irrelevant if it couldn't sense the environment. And when you say that to, uh, did, did you say that to, p to people that we have to have two people, we have to train doctors to, to speak? Yeah. 
And what is what 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 answers do you? Have? I think slowly people are realizing that it's just we we don't have the infrastructure to train people like this. But you know, when I teach my medical students, I but doctors can can a lot of doctors wants to help. Yeah, I, I, and some are learning that right. There they are can many, train themselves to yeah. speak. There are many doctors who are interested in epigenetics who who try to you know incorporate these concepts into the work. I think there's going to be a change. And today, is it more accepted? Yes, much more. And what is the process to help an ID to be accepted? I don't know. Because I've been working on it for 40 years, and I don't know why in the last 10 years you know, people get more interested. I think sometimes it's the failure of another idea. Right? Oh. Why did the Soviet Union break down? Because communism was broke apart. And maybe we need. Maybe it's the same as a kind of disease of the world. Maybe we need yeah. people to, some people to, to to find it, some people to share it. So yeah. maybe the same people who have right. to do that. Yeah, maybe. Okay, it's great. Yeah. And my last question is: What is your advice for people to use what you know about epigenetics in for have for having best results in life? I think a lot is common sense. Right, a lot of the things that epigenetics teaches us is common sense actually makes a difference, right? So if you ask a, any mother in a tribe in Africa that never saw science, is it important to be a good mother? They'll tell you yes. If you'll ask a scientist, probably they will tell you no. But probably the common sense was better than the science. <laughs> it's, is it, it's, it's easy for you to, to say that at the beginning. Yeah. And I think, I think uh, common sense, why is common sense so important, right? Common sense evolved. Right? I believe in evolution, right? So as generations pass, we get better at things, including social structures. Right? We build better social structures. These exist because they were good for us, right? Otherwise, they would not exist because we would have been selected as it, right? So having respect for common sense is really important. And, and sometimes the, uh, the rational concepts are more irrational than the irrational concept. <laughs> and, and so, you know, when I started, this idea that maternal love can, you know, change DNA sounded really insane, right, from the scientific point of view. But as I said, any grandmother in any remote tribe in the Amazonas would know that, right? So essentially, we are discovering what people discovered by common sense. We're just giving it mechanisms, which is fine, because as you said, you don't understand. You don't believe in something where you don't have a mechanism. But in the end, common sense is a very good guidance because common sense is based on, I think, human evolution. And um, we have to learn the common sense and we have to apply it. But once we appreciate that we can actually change a lot of things by our common sense, then we are driven to do that. Great. And everybody can do that. Yeah. You, know, you don't need to be a scientist to no. learn from. No. That. I think what scientists now teach you is that what scientists teach you before was wrong and actually what they knew intuitively is probably more true. And, uh, you know, and for example, you know, issues like, is family important, right? There's no human tribe anywhere in the world that doesn't have family. So you can ask the question, wait a minute, it can't be that stupid, right? So what's the common sense structure of the family? What are its strengths? Why was it selected in social evolution, right? Do, do you have mentor, or maybe die mentor like Einstein, who helps you to kind of authorization for you to, to go in this way, to go to in a, in a new way, as uh, Apple say, to, to think different? Yeah, to think different. I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's just the way I was raised. And to, and my temperament, you know. Because um, when you see people like Edison, um, Einstein, amazing how they they see the world yeah. and create new things. And right. uh, at the beginning, they were not accepted as a scientist. Uh, of course, of course, any new idea is not accepted. But the problem is that's okay, right? I mean, we should be critical about new ideas. That's fine. That's why there is science. Right? If we accepted everything, we'll be just idiots. But I think that the problem is we demonize those who come up with new ideas. We try to destroy them. So therefore, we select against new ideas, even against new good ideas. That's the problem. It's fear. It's yeah. fear. Yeah.